take their seats, please. Especially all you people at the back. They always say the sinners sit at the back. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the noisy ones, no. Thank you. They're, don't worry, the sinners at the front, I've seen them. I know they're there. <laughs> they're everywhere. I've titled today's sermon, I call it Non-Conforming Faith. Who here has seen the Poseidon Adventure? Not the new movie, but the old movie, the classic. What movie? The Poseidon Adventure. Now, in that movie, a giant tidal wave hits a ship, and the ship gets turned upside down, and everyone's confused and disorientated. And our heroes of the movie uh, find themselves on a journey to save themselves and, and, and get out of the ship. Now, as they uh, go and down the bowels of the ship and, and through the hallways of the ship, they meet another group of people. And the other group of people are going in the opposite direction to where they were going. And they have this confrontation. And they're pleading with them, saying, you're going the wrong direction. And he says, no, no, we're heading towards the bridge. And they're arguing with him and saying, no, the bridge is underwater. It's actually, we've got to head to the engine room because the boat's upside down. And that's where we've got to go and find our salvation. And so these people were heading in the wrong direction because what they didn't realise is that the world was upside down. And that is almost like a powerful little illustration of what I would call an analogy or a truth of the world today. In Romans chapter 12, it tells us that we are not to conform ourselves to this world, but to renew our mind by the transforming word of God. Because in the kingdom of God, nearly every concept, nearly every principle, nearly every truth in the kingdom of God is upside down to the world's values. And as Christians, we will always be meeting people who are going in the opposite direction to the direction that we are travelling. Because in our world, our values are upside down. Now, the title of my sermon was Non-Conforming Faith. And in other words, a faith that does not conform to the image and the patterns of this world. And so what I want to talk about and ask the question is, where does that leave us with our walk of faith? And the proposition that I want to put to you this day is simply this, that by being a born-again Christian, our world will be turned upside down as to where our faith lies, as to the direction that we have our faith heading, as to where our hope is heading. And you know, just like in the Poseidon adventure, I wonder if many Christians have cottoned on to actually where our hope is headed, to where or which direction our faith is facing. Or have we succumbed to the age, or the spirit of this age, and there really is no difference between our hope and the hope that the world has? Are we that radical, different people, when it comes to our faith and our hope, heading in the opposite direction? Well, to understand this, I think you first got to understand where the hope and where the heartbeat of the spirit of this age is. And I want you to consider where the hope of this age is. Jesus tells a parable about a certain rich person. And this certain rich person said to himself, what shall I do with myself? I know, I'll build bigger barns. So he builds his bigger barns and he fills his crops. And then he fills his barns. And once his barns are filled, he says to himself, well done, mate. Now you can sit back and slumber and watch the footy and just enjoy life and enjoy retirement because my barns are full. And Jesus looks at him and says, you fool. For this day, God requires you your soul. Why did Jesus call him a fool? Was he a fool because he was a hard worker? Because he was productive? No. He was a fool because in his worldview, he did not look past the grave. 
He had no concept that there was an afterlife and that this world is not the be end or an end of everything. He set his compass, he set his heart on everything on the now, on this age. And that really is what the spirit of this age is. It is the extent of every worldly philosophy is simply saying that we live for today, that we live for now, that's all there is, don't worry about tomorrow. Now is its time. Material is its platform and self is its centre. And Jesus basically said all those that think like that, all those that are clutching it and clinging and grasping to life in the now, Jesus said they will lose their life. But those that are willing to let go of the centre of gravity, which is hold and hold of life in this age, will find life. You could not find a more upside down value than what Jesus proclaims. Everywhere Jesus went, he said, don't worry about this age. Worry about what is to come. Don't focus your eyes on what's going to happen now. Focus your eyes on the afterlife. This is pretty much the heartbeat of everything that Jesus said. Yet Richard Dawkins, who is one of what's called the, uh, one of the uh, four horsemen of, of atheism, he said this, be thankful that you have a life and forsake your vain and presumptuous desires for a second one. What Richard Dawkins is basically saying is, is summing up the whole world's philosophy is forget about the afterlife. Don't even consider it. He calls it a vain and presumptuous thing. And he says be thankful that you have a life here and grasp hold of it. Now the philosophy behind that is the complete opposite. It is the antithesis of everything that Jesus ever proclaimed. And behind it is an assumption that if this is the only life that I have, then my centre of gravity should be on this life and this life only. Is it any wonder that our faith and our hope will find itself at odds with this world? walking in the opposite direction. Because our faith and our hope should not be centred upon this age or upon this life as though that is all there really is. Now this dramatic and radical world view is sometimes not so well defined or perceived by many Christians. For no other reason than so many of us in the church has succumbed to conformity to the world's teachings. Often Christians live their faith, their hope, as though Richard Dawkins was right. That their faith and their hope, their centre of gravity, is basically here in this world. Now when I say a centre of gravity, I'm not talking about a black and white argument. You can grab any Christian and say, is there an afterlife? And they'll say yes. And they'll say, are you going to enjoy an eternal bliss with Jesus Christ? And they'll say yes. But that's not the question. The question is, where is the centre of your gravity? Is the centre of your gravity which everything revolves around upon that life or upon this life right here? And Richard Dawkins and all his atheistic mates, which are pretty much the spirit and the powers of this age, would have you centre everything here right now on this life and get you to forget the future. This is a faith that conforms to the world and this is a faith that we should not have our centre of gravity on. Now the cure, of course, is the Word of God. We need to take the Word of God and look at its centre of gravity. And that's simply what I want to do right now with the Apostle Peter. If you turn to 1 Peter, I'm going to read from verse 3. And have a glass of water. Let's hear it now. He says in verse 3, 1 Peter, chapter 1, Blessed be the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ,
who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but you believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search in inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating, as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought at you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <coughs> in chapter... 1 in verse 3 Peter writes blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again mm -hmm. notice the tense it's caused which is now a present tense so he's basically saying you are now born again and we ask ourselves okay what is this born again born again thing that we've been born again into mm -hmm. Because it's present tense. It's something that we have right now. And he goes on to say, to say in verse 3, he says, you've been born again to a what? A living hope. A living hope. What tense is living hope? Well, that's a future tense. That's something to come. And the irony of the Christian life is that we have something now which we tangibly can hang on to but which is for the future. It is something not of this age but eternal. If you look at verse 23 in the same chapter it says since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for the sincere love of your brethren fervently love one another from the heart for you have been born again there's that word again you've been born again not a seed which is perishable but imperishable that is through the living and abiding word of God what the apostle Peter here is referring to is that our born again experience, our faith and our hope is in something that is immortal. It is something that does not fade away. It is something that is not perishable but lasts forever. In verse 24 he goes on and he says, For all the flesh is like grass and its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. In other words, what Peter is saying here is that the thing that you have is not of this world. Because the flesh and everything of this world will what? It's like the grass. It's here today and gone tomorrow. But the word of the Lord endures forever. This seed that we have is actually, in fact, not a seed, but it is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. If you turn to John chapter 3, and you can read about John, and Jesus preaching to Nicodemus, and in it, he talks to Nicodemus about being born again. And in it, again, he says, you can be born of the flesh, 
But if you are born of the flesh, you will never see the kingdom of God. Only that which is born of the Spirit will see the kingdom of God. And then Jesus gets to that wonderful scripture that we all know off by heart, John 3, 16. And I know there's someone in the congregation who would love to quote it. Who will be first? <laughs> Come on. Okay, so who's the person that's not going to perish? But the one who believes in him. Because the him is the imperishable seed. Jesus is the word that abides forever. And our born again experience is in something that is immortal. That will last from age to age and it is eternal. In John 1 it says, in the beginning was the what? The word. Was the word. In the beginning was the Word. Who is Jesus? He is immortal, everlasting. That's why it never fades. Our hope is based upon the immortality, the imperishability, if you can say such a word, of the person of Jesus Christ. So that gives us a hint of where our faith and our hope should be focused. But it's more than just based upon the immortality of Jesus Christ himself, the person. It is also based upon this. If you turn back to 1 Peter. It says that we've been born again to a living hope through the what? The resurrection. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now note here that it's not our faith and our hope that causes the resurrection. As though God is sitting there saying, oh, I hope the saints are praying really hard. I hope they're really believing because, you know, if they're not believing and if they're not hoping, well, Jesus is never going to rise from the dead. That is a twisted and a perverted faith, is it not? <coughs> because did the disciples believe anything that Jesus had said about the resurrection of the dead? Not a word of it. And even when Jesus was risen from the dead, if you read Mark, it's almost comical. They go and tell him, he's risen. And what did the disciples go? Bunch of women, what would they know? <laughs> Why would I listen to the testimony of a woman? And this is what we've been learning at the Truth Project. They still didn't believe, even when people were telling them. And so our faith and our hope doesn't cause the resurrection. The resurrection causes our faith and our hope. And Christians have got to get a hold of that and realise what it is. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But read on. The resurrection from what does the, the Apostle Peter say? He says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why is this so important? Oh, I'll tell you why. Because Richard Dawkins said that there's nothing after death. In his worldview, he said, it's this and no more. And Jesus Christ comes along and says, you know what? I died and here I am, guys. That is proof that Richard Dawkins is wrong and that there is an afterlife. It's proof that all the philosophies of the world is wrong. And it's also proof that our faith and our hope shouldn't be centred around this age or this life, that there is more. <coughs> if you go back to the Poseidon adventure for a second, there's a wonderful part in the movie where they've travelled so far, they've turned their back, on the, the direction that all the others were getting to and they get to a scene where in the boiler room and they're trapped by water and they can't go any further and they have to dive into the water swim along and go up and what they did was if you remember the movie they, they had this rope with them and so the first one went in the water and then they had to swim all the way and if he made it through what was the signal does anyone remember there'll be a tugging on the rope so in all good movies they build up the anticipation and there they are sitting at the edge of the water they've come so far they've turned their back on, on all the directions that everyone else is going and they're holding on to this rope waiting for the signal waiting for a sign 
that there is a way through. And eventually what happens? Tug, tug, tug. Mm. And there's a tug on the rope and they know that that's the proof that they've come the right way and that they too will go into the waters but they'll come up the other side. It's a wonderful picture of what Christ has died. He has gone into the depths and he has come up through the other side. And now by the Holy Spirit he's tugging on your heart saying, guys, guess what? You will die but you will come through the other side. And as Christians, we put everything, we put everything on the roulette wheel on this one fact, that we will not die, but we will live again. And Jesus' resurrection is the proof, and Jesus' resurrection is the thing that causes us to be born again. Why? Because we now have this living hope that Richard Dawkins is wrong, and I don't have to fill my barns. And I don't have to live as though this world is the only thing that's got to offer for me. There is a way through. They had turned their back on everything and they had found a way forward. Similarly for Christians, the resurrection is the proof that there is more to life than this life. And that's a wonderful proof because though we in Australia often have a wonderful life, there are many people that don't have a wonderful life. And they would like to hear that there's someone tugging on the rope saying there's more to this life than what you've been through. Yes, proof, not wishful thinking, proof. Our living hope is eternal and it is a dramatic statement that death is not the end but it is indeed the beginning. So our faith and our hope is, is based upon the person of Jesus Christ who abides forever. But it is also a statement that is based upon something that has not yet come yet. And I'm pretty sure you are all still breathing, so you haven't experienced it yet. So there's something more to come. You're going to die, face facts. I look at some of you and you're very close. <laughs> but the reality is and I don't know why we don't look at this subject more you are going to die your bodies are decaying and you are crumbling away and that is not for a reason to despair but that is our living hope that is our born again experience that is our centre of gravity thank God, thank God the Apostle Paul says that to die is but to gain Max Richardson passed away this week and as um, Rob has testified, he had this wonderful, wonderful, born again, living hope. He was dying from cancer. Did God deliver him from that cancer? Did God deliver him and cause him to live forever? Of course not, because we have to die. If we don't die, we don't get the resurrection. And so Max knew that. And because he knew that, that caused him to live a born-again life. A living hope, the Apostle Peter calls it. But there's more reason why we, as Christians, base our faith and our hope and put our centre of gravity on that which is to come. Because if you read 1 Peter carefully, you'll see some wonderful gems in there. It says in verse 4 that we have this living hope, I'm just reading from verse 3, we have this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So these are all things that are pointing to the future. And then Peter goes on to obtain an inheritance. What is an inheritance? Is that something that you get now or later? Later. So once again, our centre of gravity is on something that's down the track. He says that we have an inheritance which is what? Imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. Well, we've covered the undefiled and the imperishable bit, and it will not fade away. But I want to ask you a question. Where is such a place? Where is such a place where our inheritance is to be that's undefiled, that's unfading and imperishable. Is it in this lifetime? 
can it possibly be in this world? Because everything I see in this world is perishing. Everything I see in this world is fading away. And there is nothing in this world that is immortal. And so where is this place found? Well, the Apostle Peter says, it is reserved in heaven for you. What a wonderful scripture. Reserved in heaven. How wonderful it is when you go parking somewhere and someone's reserved a place for you to park. Or you go to the, the, you know, the wedding banquet and you're looking for your name and your seat's reserved and you're, oh yeah, <laughs> reserved a place for me. I'm really excited about that. Well here, Jesus is saying that this wonderful gift, this born again living hope, it's reserved for you where? In heaven. Again, this is a powerful testimony to where we should have our centre of gravity. You read on, and it says, um, I'll read on a little bit more, now reserved for you in heaven, who are protected by the power of God through faith, a salvation ready to be revealed, revealed when people? Now or the last time? Because I listen to a lot of Christian preachers, and they're trying to tell me that I can have everything now. That everything is now. <clears throat> Yet I find the word of God says no. A living hope, a living hope has to be a living hope because it's reserved for you in heaven. And this is very, very, very important. And this is where the subtlety of the world comes in. Because the subtlety and the schemes of the enemy would have you think like Richard Dawkins that everything has to be now because this is all we've got. And that world's philosophy, it feeds into so much of Christian teaching where so many Christians are bound up with this concept that I've got to have everything in heaven right here, now on my plate, now. And we treat God like a butler. And we stomp our feet and we demand the things that the Word of God clearly says are reserved for you in heaven. We're pretty much like the Son that says to the Father, Give me my inheritance now. <laughs> what do you want your inheritance now for in this world? Why on earth would you want your inheritance now? In the, what, do you want to live forever in the state that you're in right now? Uh -huh. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. It is the spirit of the age that corrupts the pure doctrine. And this is why the Apostle Paul, and this is why the early church, this is why they went around and didn't give a rat about how they lived in this world. They weren't concerned about filling their barns. They weren't concerned if they went without. They weren't concerned if things didn't go well. Why? Because their hope was fixed on the when and the revelation of Jesus Christ, the future. Amen. Uh, let's read on. Uh, so when is this salvation ready to be revealed? In the last days. Um, then we get to verses 5, 6, uh, six and 7. And we get the, what's called the reverse argument. And it goes like this. It says, In this you will greatly, greatly rejoice. Why do we greatly rejoice? Because we have our inheritance now? No, read on what he says. It says, even though for now a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Who he has been distressed? Let me see those hands, brothers and sisters. I see the hand at the back. That's right. We're distressed. In this lifetime, the Word of God promises you trials and distress. Why? Because we live in a cursed world that's falling. And there's one thing I can guarantee you that this life will bring pain and suffering. You can take that to the bank. That the proof, now the reason for this in verse 7 says that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Why is this all necessary? So that your faith, which is the most precious thing that you have, it is your living hope. 
Or why does God allow these things to happen? Why is it that it almost seems like the God of this age triumphs and rules when we know that he doesn't? Because God wants you to focus your hope and your faith in something that is imperishable, which is the person of Jesus Christ and him and him alone. That you may res- that this fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honour. When? When do you get your praise and your honour and your glory? When is it, church? Let me hear it. When you get to heaven. At the revelation at Jesus Christ. When is the revelation of Jesus Christ? When he comes back. Is it now? That's right. It's when he comes back. <coughs> Again, everything that the Apostle Peter is teaching here is future tense. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says, If Christ be not raised from the dead, then your faith is useless. It is a vain thing. And in fact, he even says more than that. He says, you, where, he says, if our faith is for this lifetime only, we are to be pitied among more than all people. In other words, if, if our faith and our expression of our hope is only for this lifetime at all, the Apostle Paul is smart enough to go, man, what a bunch of losers. You might as well eat, drink and be merry and do what Richard Dawkins says and go and grab life and enjoy it. But our faith is not fixed upon this lifetime. It is fixed on another lifetime. And that's why the Apostle Paul then goes on to say, shipwreck, no worries. Beating, not a problem. Tortured, not a problem. Hungry, no worries. Kicked out of the synagogue, yep, no problems. Got no clothes, got no food, got nothing. I'm happy with that. Because I am running the race. And I am heading to the upward calling in Christ Jesus, which is the resurrection. That is what he was looking for. And that's why he didn't really care whether his barns were full or not. Because the Apostle Paul is not a fool. And he knew that there was something more than this life. Now to come to all of this comes the imperative teaching, the commands. All through the New Testament we've got what's called the indicative teaching which is you're seated in Christ, you're adopted sons, you've got this, you've got that, you've got this, you've got that. But it's all got to mean something, doesn't it? What's the point of all this juicy, wonderful theology if it doesn't mean anything? And that's why the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, especially when they're there in the epistles, you know, they'll spend chapters upon chapters telling you how good you've got it. And then they go, therefore, because of that, live like this. And so what is the commandment to all this teaching? If the world be not worthy of our attention, if life is little more than grass, which is here today and gone tomorrow, if faith for this lifetime is to be pitied, and in fact is a vanity, that's what the Apostle Paul said, if this world is little more than a trial and distress to hone your faith, then the Apostle Peter's Final verses. Thunders home a very powerful truth. And I just want to read it to you. In verse 13, we read, therefore. This is the therefore verse. Whenever you see a, a therefore, it's because they've just written something absolutely wonderful. And the Apostle Paul says, therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. And now listen to this. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read it again. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read it again. (laughs) Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How much of our hope are we to fix on this? Just some of it? Just a little bit of it? All of it. Why? Because that is what being born again 
is all about. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, while the rest of the world fixes its hope on this age, we as Christians are called to fix our hope on the next age. In conclusion, if we succumb to the lies of Richard Dawkins, if we succumb to the spirit of this age, then our born-again life will be found wanting. And as the Apostle Paul said, we should be pitied more above than any other. If our faith and our hope is only for this age, what's the point? Even Paul acknowledges that it's worthless. By conforming to the world's lies, many have pegged too much of their hope onto this age. And then when the testing comes, our faith falters. The world laughs and Christians mourn their misplaced hope. I have a powerful story to tell of a relative of mine who was an uncle, was a brilliant man. Probably one of the most brilliant men. You could take his brain and all you people gathered together with your combined intelligence probably wouldn't match his. <laughs> brilliant man. And he had a child who was crippled. Crippled in the hips, crippled in the legs. Uh, Carol was her name, she's my cousin. And he believed all his life all his life that she would be healed. In the last seven years he got dementia and started to lose everything. We watched him slowly, slowly die. Carol, his daughter, never got healed and they built a two-story house <coughs> with steps, no ramps, nothing. All by faith because she was going to get healed and uh, she'd be able to climb those steps. Well, the truth of the matter is that she's bound in a wheelchair and her home has become, well that home became a prison. The rest of my family, uh, sorry, um, my other cousins, continue on to believe that Colin Harvey would be healed of his dementia. And they pin their hope that he'd be healed and when he was healed, Carol would be healed. Well, not more than a month ago, Colin passed away. And they never saw it come to place. And it rattled their world. It rattled their world. Because of the truth of the matter is that if you peg all your hopes in this world, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Because I've got a news flash for all of you. You're going to die. You're going to age and you will pass away. And your faith is not going to stop that. And no matter how much you hope and wish, it ain't going to stop. Now sometimes God does work miracles. I don't doubt that for one minute. The kingdom of God comes along and there are sparks. And we see testimonies as to what the kingdom of God is like. But to suppose that all of us, and every single one of us, should have a completely healthy life forever and live in complete prosperity forever. That is the foolishness of a man who says, let my barns be filled. And we've just turned it into a Christian version, that's all. We've just spiritualized it. And God sits in heaven and says, I never promised that. I never said that. What I did promise was a living hope. Because this world is passing away. And we are not of the age of this world. We are not of the age of this world. And when we live like that, when we play by the world's standards and live as though there was no tomorrow, you know what happens? We get snookered. We outsmart ourselves and we get snookered. I want to read to you another scripture. And this is my final one. <clears throat> I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul.
in Colossians chapter 3. Just so you think that the Apostle Peter might have been a heretic, let's listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say on the exact same subject and see where his heartbeat is. Because it rings true to the inevitable conclusion what the Apostle Paul taught what being born again is all about. In Colossians 1, uh, sorry, chapter 3, verse 1, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. You know, our world is turned upside down. And for us, it means to fix our eyes completely on the return and the revelation of Jesus Christ on the last day. Because you know why? Jesus is the imperishable seed. Jesus is the abiding word. Jesus is our reserved inheritance and salvation. Jesus is the one that conquers death for us. Jesus is the incorruptible gift that will never fade. And Jesus is the rock on which our faith is built to endure and withstand all manner of attack from the schemes of this age. We are not fools who seek bigger barns, but we are strangers longing for our eternal home. And to this we fix our gaze, and we must not, and we cannot afford to conform our faith to the spirit of this age. Thanks, Dan.